In this presentation, we're going to be taking a look at the ecological evolutionary perspective in sociology. This perspective is rooted, at least partially, in the older theory of evolution as set forth by Charles Darwin, who was influenced by earlier predecessors such as Herbert Spencer and even Malthus. And the notions of human survival are key to evolution uh, from a sociological perspective. And uh, we, we have to be careful here not to invoke uh, necessarily the ideas of social Darwinism uh, as Spencer's work has come to be viewed because of the problems it has in terms of blaming the poor, for instance, for not being fit or something like that, reducing culture to biological explanation. And in, uh, the best evolutionary theories today are those that uh, take into account culture as the primary adaptive tool for human culture, human society. And so it's a systems view, which is also unique to this perspective when compared to others. And much like the general functionalist paradigm assumes that stability is the normal state of affairs. Talcott Parsons' work could be characterized within this perspective, at least in terms of his Agile model, which included the notions of adaptation goal attainment, integration, and latency, and more recently the work of Gerhard Lenski uh, certainly may actually be the, the best uh, example of evolutionary theory and sociology today, and draws on the work of Malthus and Spencer to the degree that he considers resource scarcity, population, different struggles, and the role of cultural adaptation. In Lenski's model, he winds up with a typology of societies uh, from the evolutionary perspective. The societies include the hunter hunters and gatherers, horticultural societies, agricultural or agrarian societies, industrial, fishing, herding, and maritime societies. And of course, a lot of these different types of societies have to do with the environmental conditions that uh, human societies uh, are embedded in. The ecological school of thought actually traces its roots to the evolutionary theory of Darwin insofar as Ernest Tackle was one of Darwin's students and coined the term ecology. But for social scientists and sociology in particular, uh, it's the Chicago school that really took this term ecology and applied it to human society. And they did so largely as a metaphor and they came to view communities as spatial units that are dynamic and changing based on the mechanisms of competition over territory, or what they called natural areas, and the different types of land uses that would follow. The most central figure in the Chicago school was Robert Park, and he introduced notions of competition, uh, determining spatial forms and ecological functions, he described symbiotic relationships that uh, follow a period of competition and conflict. And he introduced the idea of natural areas in the city all right, as the product of competition and functional efficiency and said that natural areas should be the basic unit of analysis. And the city of Chicago itself uh, became a laboratory for applying many of these concepts and that's why we associate it with the Chicago School. And the most well-known outcomes of uh, the Chicago School in ecology was Burgess's concentric zone theory, which is the, the basic idea that cities develop outwards. Starting with a dense core, they proceed through a process of dominance, invasion, and succession to create additional natural areas, or zones in transition. And the, the five zones identified by Burgess include the Central Business District, the Business and Light Manufacturing, the Zone in Transition, Workers' Residency, and the Commuter Zone. And to some extent, this model still holds some relevance when we look at certain cities, not all. And the problem is, of course, assuming that a one-size-fits-all model uh, will, will work with all different cities' arrangements. There have been some other uh, models offered in the ecological school 
apart from concentric zone theory, and these, uh, these additional models try to address some of the weaknesses of central or concentric zone theory. And one of those is Hoyt's urban sector theory, which is less of a circular model and more of a sectoral model where these spatial areas sort of cut across uh, the, the zones that were identified by Burgess. And the main mechanism here is transportation lines, uh, as noted by Hoyt. Similarly, Harris and Ullman's multiple nuclei theory suggests that cities don't really have just one center anymore. Uh, maybe some do, but a number of especially more recently developed cities evolve around several different centers, what they call nuclei, and that different parts of town have different specializations. After the Chicago School largely sort of faded away, it was dominant in the 1930s and 40s, but by the 1950s, many of the spatial ideas had been abandoned, and what went on to be con continued to call ecology was largely social and cultural. And uh, some of the early advocates of this perspective, such as Fiery, were critical of classical ecology for ignoring the cultural and social dynamics that were taking place and pointed to the limits of the biological metaphor. Uh, Heckscher argued that land use is explained to a large degree by cultural preferences for individuality, freedom, growth, and business success. And eventually these ideas would be encompassed in mainstream sociology and no longer associated with a particular subfield. Even Worth's uh, urbanism as a way of life, although Worth was part of the Chicago School, voiced uh, concern with issues beyond space, and he was largely reducing things to demographic variables, population size and density, and promoting diversity in cities, and he argued that it was this diversity that led to the competition, exploitation, and disorder that we associate with urban areas. But the most coherent school of thought in the ecological tradition to follow the Chicago School was the neo-orthodox ecological school as embodied primarily by the work of Amos Hawley in, the in 1950 and in subsequent writings after that. And here the shift again focused from spatial distributions to the adaptations of populations to functional differentiation. And remember that functionalism was the dominant paradigm and here the ecological tradition was highly compatible if not a simple uh, sub part of the functionalist tradition. And here adaptations are understood culturally not biologically as was the case with Spencer for instance and uh, defines community again as an equilibrium of cooperation viewing that as the normal state of affairs. Another important contribution within the neo-orthodox ecological tradition was the poet model offered by Otis Dudley Duncan, which stands for Population, Organization, Environment, and Technology, and in fact this continues to hold relevance to contemporary thought. And by the 1970s, the ecological tradition came to morph into what we now call environmental sociology, and that all started largely with the work of Riley Dunlap and William R. Catton, Jr., who claimed to have a new human ecology. And essentially that meant returning focus not only to space and the spatial arrangement of communities, but also to the natural elements of that space or the environment. And certainly this coincides with the rising tide of the environmental movement and was a response to it to some degree. And as I said, this would morph into just mainstream environmental sociology. The classical ecological school received recent attention, uh, primarily due to the work of Ralph S Sampson, who wrote The Great American City. And again, Sampson implored us to take geography seriously and to take advantage of some recent advances in that area, particularly with the role of GIS technology, which provides a much more robust and sophisticated way to study physical space and to study social processes using these tools. Also in recent years, the 
structural ecology perspective has been offered, uh, for instance, in the work of Frank Young, who is really building on several decades of related work coming out of the Cornell School. And Frank Young offers a very simple model that essentially says that population health is a function of community capacity relative to threats, and that uh, successful communities will be able to adapt based on a number of capacity characteristics, and those include pluralism, differentiation, solidarity, fluidity, linkages, and equality. And these things are all ideas that have been around for several decades, as I said. So in conclusion, uh, these perspectives remain relevant. Evolution continues to be a useful way to think about human communities and particularly with a focus on how culture helps different communities adapt. In addition, ecology's focus on physical space and the natural environment remains unique in the social sciences, and this addresses a major problem with a lot of social science theory, which tends to be aspatial, and that is, they don't consider the roles of space or the environment. And taken together, these perspectives therefore remain highly important to contemporary social science theory.